<laughs> we meet again. Always, as usual. This is a continuation of a ongoing can you hear? conversation. All right. You can hear better now? Um, so Kevin and I figured out what in the spring we've known each other 17 years. Sounds right. So I this don't even is remember remembering that. But oh wow, um, that's the sign of middle age coming <laughs> on. Um, so this is a really a continuation of an ongoing conversation for the two of us um, about um, African American art and expression, American life. Um, and the weirdnesses and strangeness of how we've gotten to this moment in the 21st century. Um, as you can see, this big, beautiful book is rather thick. Um, there are a lot of ideas here, and as usual with uh, Kevin's particular verve and style, he's laid it out um, brilliantly. Um, so what I hope to do is turn this into a little bit like office hours. Okay. And I'm coming in and I need some... Need some help? I need some help. So uh, what is bunk? What is bunk? Uh, well, you know, bunk is a great word. Um, it was a word that came late in the process of writing this book. I worked on this book about six years. And um, so toward the end, I realized the title I had going, which later became sort of one of the section titles, just wasn't very good for the whole idea. Um, and what I like about bunk is it comes from, uh, well, it's an American word, A, and B, that also involves race and politics, something that I think that the hoax often involves. And so um, it comes from the Missouri Compromise of 1820. And uh, a representative from Buncombe County, which is in North Carolina, said that he, though they were filibustering and had won the vote already, he said he wanted to go on and say something for Buncombe. And people then changed that to B-U-N-K-U-M. Uh, and then it got shortened to Bunk. But in a broader sense, it, it applies to sort of uh, blather, you know, talk that isn't quite saying what it means or going on for the sake of one's own voice, in a broader sense, it also means kind of BS, you know, mm. and stuff we know isn't true, but is being told as true. Um, and in the case of the hoax, uh, something this book investigates, uh, it's really something that pretends to be true, though uh, someone somewhere knows it's not. Uh, now, the question that comes up for me is, does the hoaxer really believe their own hoax? At a certain point, sometimes it seems like they do, and... Um, you know, the early days of the hoax, I think, with P.T. Barnum, which is where I start uh, and go all the way to the present day, there's a really interesting dance that people do, I think, with believing themselves or, be you know, how much are you supposed to believe on how much are you just trying to get away with. But, but it seems before we can get to hoax, we have to kind of rest on humbug for a minute because this yeah. becomes a really important word, especially in the opening parts of the book. And determining the difference between um, what bunk as blather is and what a hoax is. Because a hoax seems really, really planned and played out in very specific fashion. But Barnum begins by promoting a concept, his own conceptualization of humbug. Yeah. So what's the difference between just blather and humbug on our way to hoax? I mean... Uh those are <laughs> good, good question. Um, one I think about daily. Um, I, I think that you know Barnum would probably say money. You know, mm. he managed to monetize the hoax, um, and I think his notion of humbug is interesting because it involves giving you a good show. It isn't simply just pr presenting something; it's also presenting something that is somewhat entertaining, even if it's fooling you. Um, you know, and I think it's important to think about. He had uh, uh, one of his early sort of successes was a thing called the Fiji Mermaid. He spelled it F-E, 
E J E E. And the advertisements for it look really beautiful, like a really beautiful woman, you know, like a mermaid. And then you would go in and it was a um, desiccated monkey torso with a fish sewn to it. Um, it was obviously <laughs> fake um, and certainly nothing like the poster. But what he provided to you, I think, was this on the way out. Oh, gee, I was fooled, but also how could I be so foolish and believe that there was really mermaids? And so he was playing with your expectations, but also giving you something else instead. The other famous one is, of course, he would um, show you to the egress, you know, this way to the egress, and you thought it was another show, and it was, you know, just the exit. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and one of my other favorite quotes from Barnum that I use in the book is, every crowd has a silver lining, you know. And, and his notion of trying to sell us something is, is very much part of humbug, in my opinion. But I think the other thing that, in a deeper way, he promised his crowds, you know, was this sort of democratic ideal. You could mm. decide for yourself, was this real or was it fake? And, and that power in the people, as it were, in the audience at least, was I think really a big, important moment. And for me, the difference between humbug and then sort of the hoax more broadly, and certainly in this new moment, or, or is it, you know, connected mm. moment of fake news, is that now there are no experts. You know, we're told right. that experts don't matter, right. that if you're a scientist and you say there's climate change, you know, I might think differently, and right. my opinion is just the same. And so that democratic principle gets stretched to a kind of nihilistic principle almost. And I think that's a troubling difference. Um, but even Barnum himself, you know, he had some troubling moments that we can talk about if, if you want. So in, in that exchange, uh, when we as members of the crowd go to yeah. one of his exhibitions, um, we're supposed to get some pleasure in there, some oh, entertainment from having been fooled. Um, well, it's like but, a magic trick. You okay, know, you're like, okay. I don't know quite how he did it. Um, or, you know, I see what he did there. <laughs> you know, right, there's a little right, bit of both. Right. And sort of the, the best analogy I have is for like reality shows on TV, um, which I watch. Um, and, you know, there's a kind of weird mixed pleasure, right? You're, you're not just watching The Bachelor, you're watching yourself watch The Bachelor, mm -hmm. but you're also, or Survivor, or what have you. Um, but we know that they're clearly constructed. I mean, these people haven't really washed up on a desert island and they're eliminating people from some made-up tribe. Um, and if we poke too hard at it, I mean, there's a lot going on there, right, mm -hmm. about colonialism or whatever. But there's also this quality that we get invested on the real conflicts that emerge in this fake situation. And I think that's a little bit like what we're talking about, you know, in this 19th century humbug. There's a level of fakery, but then there was a level of real stuff being worked out. Okay, so I think I'm following you. <laughs> the bunk to humbug to hoax, hoax seems really um, a kind of merger, a kind of complication of all of it because we're supposed to also get pleasure from the hoax, but you seem to break it down um, into, and I, this is something that keeps coming back to me from, from the book, that um, it's not just that we're involved in the magic trick and drawing pleasure from it, but that there has to be at some moment a revelation, whether yeah. that's immediate or over time. Sure. Um, so at least in that part of the hoax, why do we need the revelation or why does the hoaxer need the revelation to be part of the play? Um, well, I think in Barnum's case, he was like the first to realize that even the discovery could be part of the hoax and humbug and the money making. So um, there's a account I talk about where he had uh, a famous um, bearded lady, um, which was a very famous, you know, kind of um, show in, in the sideshow. 
and um, someone stood up and screamed at the, the bearded lady and said, you're not real, you know, you're a dude um, in a dress, you know, um, which was, of course, like the worst thing that possibly could happen if you were a bearded lady. Um, so they, they go, and there's, you know, there's all this hubbub, a doctor comes, you know, they inspect, prove that it's really a woman, which it actually was, and then it turns out, of course, the, both the doctor and the person screaming and accusing were Barnum's, you know, uh, people. Right. Um, so he made more money off this kind of disclosure and contesting of the truth, right? I don't think the hoax totally does that, but I, I do think there's a way in which hoaxes, and I try not to sort of chop them up too finely. I mean, in the end, they all seem like hoaxes, um, but they seem different kinds in a way. But they all have this element of wanting to be discovered, you know, and often when you look back at the hoax, once revealed, it has all these clues in it. Mm -hmm. um, there's one of my favorite hoaxes is a woman uh, named Margaret Seltzer who pretended to be a gang member from South Central LA, though she was really like a white lady from, I think, Orange County or something. Um, and she also pretended to be native and white. Um, and then in her book, when you read it, uh, she said she was a blood, so there was no, instead of a crip, um, and so the crips, ha you know, was with a C, and so she has no C's in her entire book. <laughs> so it's like, I went to school with a K. Mm -hmm. um, it's pretty bad. Um, but, you know, she's trying to, to, to do something, you know, there's all these clues about, you know, oh, you know, I'm, I'm she says things like, you know, no one's going to suspect me, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> that later seem pretty obvious tells. Um, but I think these kind of tells are part of the hoax, and you know, at times they're part of its pleasure, but I also talk about how the hoax has changed, you know, and now the hoax, instead of being about honoring or talking about some high ideal, even if it was a mermaid, it's now really about pain. Is, is that why, for instance, um, we need two, three months after the end of The Bachelor or The Bachelorette to see on the cover of whatever magazine in the grocery store whether the relationship has worked out? Yeah, that's a good question. If I only had thought of that. Um, <laughs> no, The Bachelor, to me, um, that is part of it. You mm. know, like, I, and I admit, I'm a, is it a Fairweather fan? I just watch it and I literally never remember any of their names. <laughs> Won't remember right. anything week to week. And that's, you know, like, uh, Kate will be like, oh, did you see the, you know, I don't know. She'll s say, Jimmy is, is going. I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, right. Because I like that transient quality mm -hmm. of it. But I do think there's this thing they're selling, which is about permanence, mm -hmm. you know, and, and the narrative has to go there. It has to have a story. And that sort of narrative need is one that I think the hoax preys on a lot. Uh, okay. It preys on our need for things to make a kind of sense. Um, and so even when you look back and say this, a woman claims that she was, uh, survived the Holocaust by being raised by wolves, um, and that as a 10-year-old she killed a soldier with her bare hands and, you know, was literally raised by wolves. I don't mean like metaphorically. I mean literally followed wolves mm -hmm. across Europe. Um, and it was about to be a Disney movie, it was about to be this, and you know, it became clearly, it was clearly a hoax always, but it be, got revealed as one. You know, you start to think that the stakes, while they're kind of funny at first, aren't really funny right. in the end. The, the, um, in the 19th century, where you yep. spend a lot of time to kind of build our understanding of these concepts, yeah. you talk about how important um, plagiarism is. Yeah. Um, we frown upon plagiarism now, um, but it seems to be kind of wedded to our journalistic tradition from the very beginning, that there, have to, there has to be some kind of fake news to drum up attention, to build the narrative of the hoax. Yeah. Um, talk about that a little bit, because I found that a kind of interesting uh, reflection on our moment now. Yeah. Well, can we look at a slide? Maybe that will help us. So this is the image that I used for the cover before you were seeing the cover. Um, and there's a story that I, I want to tell about these two who, what I, that I think gets at some of this fakery. Mm -hmm. This gentleman on the right is named William Johnson. Um, he's in the furry suit there. And um, he was exhibited by Barnum in 1860, just months after Origin of the Species, um, as a figure called, what is it, uh, question mark. Um, and, can we go ahead, uh, one? 
So this, and then later he got known as Zip. Uh, and you can see over here on the left in the pink uh, little pamphlet, it's only about, it's almost a little bit bigger than a playing card. This is the kind of pamphlet they would sell at shows, and it says Life of Zip, the original, and then down here you can barely see it, what is it? You know, that was his name and his designation. Mm -hmm. And this being called an it by Barnum, you know, I talk about a lot because I think it gets at both Barnum's ingenuity, let's call it, because he is just months after this groundbreaking, world-changing text that changes our notions of who we are and how we got here, evolution. Um, he says, well, but here's this devolved thing, right? right? Um, and this is a bit more typical of the depiction of uh, what is it at the time in 1860, um, though he was, you know, drawn as, as more a creature. And in this pamphlet, it describes him as walking on all fours, you know, uh, th this one claims he was in Australia, not Africa, but, you know, they, it didn't matter because it was just this exotic place mm -hmm. that he could talk about. Can we go ahead, one? Can we go ahead, another one? So this is... Uh, these are two, these images I've taken are from Harvard University's archive, I should say. And these two are, are flyers from the American Museum at the time that Barnum ran. And so you can see on the left, it is what is it. It's not, sometimes all three were capitalized, I would read, and I was like, no, it's clearly what is it. You know, he's supposed to be this non-being. And in fact, the description that Barnum used is that he was a nondescript. You know, and so here you have this black man being described as the missing link. Um, what is that about, you know? How does that, and it was a hugely popular show. And then over here you can see some of the other shows that he, and that's a depiction of him sort of crouched there. But, you know, there are other kind of questions being asked. What can they be, these mysterious animals? And then over here there's the great living black sea lion, you know? So he was in this continuity of these things. And then if we can go back one. So what I discovered looking through archives, because um, he was described as also then later as Zip, as in Zippy the Pinhead descends mm -hmm. from uh, this depiction, or uh, as I said, the Coneheads who came from far away France, you mm -hmm. know, uh, if you remember those. Um, but if you see here, he doesn't look like he has any of the traits that Barnum ascribed to him, even microcephaly, which some you know, of the other people he displayed did. And so I started realizing that not only was the cover story fake, which we knew he was never the missing link, but even the story that we sort of told later was fake. So at the end of his life, uh, and he lived a long time, he was, as I said, first shown in 1860, and I say shown because that's how it was depicted, mm -hmm. um, and he died in 1926, and over that time, it's thought that many millions of people saw him. And, um, he, so he was a show person for 60 years, and when he died, he said, well, we fooled them a long time, didn't we, to his mm, sister. Mm. And so I started thinking a lot about, well, what does this say about race and about us? Both that <clears throat> we had this, this need to describe him in this certain way, and then this, this, the truth, which is visual for us, you know, and <laughs> I think was visual for folks then, um, is so different. And I think that tension is where Barnum made his money or mark, mm -hmm. you know. Um, we still have some of that today, but to see Zip or William Johnson and that noble stance, if we can go all the way back to the first slide that you see here, with him, with uh, this is uh, what is what's called a leopard boy, Ashbury Ben, his name is. That's his skin there, those are stockings. Um, and these, these are both questions of race and think, having us think about display. And they had this famous boxing match, apparently. Um, and I, what I love is that Ben looks, has a blonde mohawk like Basquiat in 1983. <laughs> right. um, so, you know, like there's a, there's a lot going on. The other thing that, that I would say is, um, you know, Barnum's first big show was Joyce Heff, a right. black woman he said was, um, George Washington's nursemaid, um, which would have made her 161 years old. Um, and Barnum made this very clear. She's 161, you know, and people really went and tried to test her body often physically and touch her and handle her and, and try to interact with her to get a uh, connection to our first president. And then here I am six years later in the archive 
finding this picture, and on his little pin is Washington. Right. You know, I started thinking, wow, what, he, what did he know that Joyce Heff even didn't know, but, and that Barnum probably didn't either. Hmm. Um, so he tells us a lot about sort of the founding of the hoax and its knitting with race and these stories that we tell ourselves that, you know, often aren't true. You, you make a great case for um, the confluence uh, of Barnum beginning, uh, the beginning of uh, the, the, the penny uh, newspapers in New yeah. York City, and blackface minstrelsy. They all are happening at similar yeah. moments. And um, I, I'm, I'm going to leap a little bit ahead with Please. blackface, but also connect it to this idea that comes up a little later in the work about exoticism generally and what we now kind of refer to as the other. But talk a little bit about the exoticization of... Um, Asians and Aboriginal people and Africans right. as part of developing these hoax narratives. Yeah. Why is blackface so important to... Well, because, I guess because it still happens, you know. Uh, every Halloween, there's like a notice that goes out, don't dress in blackface. Don't wear a <laughs> war bonnet. And the internet is just filled with people who do exactly that. Mm -hmm. um, what is that impulse about, you know? Um, and the one who comes to mind most is Rachel Dolezal, who you may remember pretended to be black, was uh, a white lady. Mm -hmm. um, and she ran the NAACP in, I think, Washington State, is yeah, that right? Yeah, um, or, a, or a branch of it, at least. A branch of Washington State? No, or the branch of oh, the NAACP sorry. in Washington. Um, yes, exactly. She, ran, she didn't run the whole thing. Right, right. Thank goodness. Um, but she, you know, she sort of had this crazy, like, I don't know, career there for a minute, right? right? She, resur she surfaced up. And some of the questions that people would ask her, like, are you, at, in fact, black? And she's like, I don't understand the question, which I'm not sure if you've ever had that question no, no. not understood. I think that's rather <laughs> clear, right? <laughs> One's like, yes, you know, it's a yes or no question. Yeah. So um, that's a fascinating thing. But really, the serious part of it is, you know, A, that she was taken a bit seriously. You know, she was on the Today Show a lot in a way that black folks sometimes aren't. And then the second part of that was a week later, you might remember, was the Charleston shooting, which seems so much, you know, it seems many, many shootings ago, mm -hmm. unfortunately, mm -hmm. right? Um, but I want to write about it because those two events seem to me not totally coincidental. They seem to me to somehow both misunderstand blackness in similar ways. Um, and they were so connected to trauma. And I think the exoticization you're talking about is also part of it. They were both mm -hmm. about blackness and, you know, you could fill in the blank from these other mm -hmm. um, hoaxes and, and misunderstandings, purposeful ones that we've seen. Um, they both, they understood it as pain, you know, and um, there's even that sort of account of D Dylan Roof, whose name I don't use in the book on um, purpose, his sort of, what? These people aren't, you know, murdering each other while I'm sitting there praying with them, but then he murders them, mm -hmm. you know, and her misunderstanding of Rachel Dolezal's of blackness seems to me also related. Um, but there's this long tradition, and some of it is deeply American, uh, whether you think of the Boston Tea Party dressing up, or you think of, you know, people in the end of the 19th century going to see at World's Fair is very different people. I think I traced the 1891 right. just in a paragraph, and it's like Aunt Jemima debuted there. It wasn't real, but um, she was there nonetheless. Um, you know, there were cannibals from other places. There were black folks dressed as other black, you know, there was lots of fakery happening, but being presented as ethnography. And so that linking of fakery and thinking about race and thinking about the other, the exotic other, um, is really integral to our understanding of race. I was struck by the, I think you have a picture in the book of, I can't remember what year the World's Fair was here in Chicago, yeah. but there was an exhibition uh, to, you know, go, come and take a look at Darkest Africa, and all the black people represented were Chicagoans. Yeah, um, they're from the South Side. I mean, they could be Africans. Um, <laughs> True, but they, they weren't. They weren't. 
Um, so how, how is a hoax different from what we might call now just a hustle? That's a great question. Is this a Chicago question? Well, you know, <laughs> I, used to I think these I folks little, understand I, what a hustle is. Yeah, you know. how are you getting your hustle on, huh? Yeah. I think that a hoax isn't measured by like its intent, but by its harm, mm -hmm. and, and by the way it, it lingers, and the way it often taps into these store of divisive issues, divisive thoughts, um, things that divide our nation, I think are the things the hoax gravitates to and makes use of. And I think it's real danger is that it um, sort of distracts us from the important stuff, A, and then B, it also you know, gets us to believe the worst about each other. And I think that's the change in the hoax that I tried to understand. And when I was thinking about it six years ago, it seemed like it was probably true. By the time I finished the book, it seemed like, yeah, I think it's true. And then like a week later, um, you know, the world exploded and fake news was everywhere. And um, it very much was uh, something that seems to have become more and more true, this fakery. But it seems like this is something that we can't disconnect f from our essential kind of cultural uh, connectedness. This seems to be an essentially American thing. I mean, I think it's, yes. I mean, there, was a, uh, there is something American about it. And that, that's what spurred me from making it, you know, just as an idea to really making it a book, mm. um, was trying to trace that tradition. And when I decided that Barnum was one of the keys to that, it really helped. Um, and, you know, I, I think that movement is one, the hoax has sort of almost become more American. You know, and we have this tradition, like you said, of the hustle, like mm -hmm. of, you know, the con man is an American invention, um, whether you go back to Melville or, or, or what. But this, the con artist is often something we portray as, you know, positive or at mm -hmm. least a kind of interesting antihero. Um, but I started tracing the ways that the con, in terms of the hoax, is so often about race and so often unstated um, and gets us to believe these horrible things, whether it's that, you know, Susan Smith and uh, the Carolinas getting us to believe for a moment that a black man had stolen her children when mm -hmm. in fact she had killed them mm -hmm. uh, uh, tragically. Um, and, you know, that had real life effect on the black folks who were walking around um, who were often arrested, you know, off this and, and, and uh, put in jeopardy. And so we've seen sort of that, because over the time I was writing the book, I realized now it was Black Lives Matter. Right. And the, and the world had sort of shifted, or at least there was now evidence, and it would be like, oh, there's evidence. And... Still and, and yet, <laughs> right. Yeah, so that kind of... Um, it's not about evidence or just facts. It's also about this hoax that uh, makes use of race, but also the ways that race makes use of hoaxing and has in its own way, is made up of hoax. Um, we, we have a few more minutes before we should um, take questions, but I don't want to give anything away about the uh, later parts of the, the, the book. Why not? But I, yeah. Okay, why not? Why not? Um, can you talk a little bit about how, say, for instance, Lance Armstrong's doping or uh, Jason Blair's plagiarism or even James Fry's plagiarism uh, are quintessential 21st century examples of, right. of this long tradition? Yeah, I mean, I started thinking at a certain point that, um, you know, was the hoax getting worse? Um, and are the hoaxes themselves getting worse? And I realized, yes. <laughs> um, and these are all places, I mean, I think Lance Armstrong, I mean, I don't know, did you ever believe him, that he was, you know, Oh, I always thought super, he was cheating. You always thought he was cheating. Yeah. How many people here thought he was always cheating? Not as many as you think, right? Right, right. I don't think, I think there were times I'm like, I'm not sure, you know? And then his, his cheating was so extensive, and if you read, like there's a book called um, Cycle of Lies, you know, mm -hmm. which is a great sort of pun title, um, that goes into depth about you know, him. He was cheating early on. You know, he wasn't yeah. like he started cheating after he had cancer. He was cheating before then. Um, and then the things he did to sort of damage the people who were telling the truth 
the demonizing of people who used to be his friends in often cases is just unbelievable. Right. Um, and I guess what I started thinking about is why did we want it to be true? Hmm. You know, because what happened for me is I started off writing about why we deceive, and then I started writing about why we believe. You know, and why do we, you know, take it for reality that Armstrong somehow, uh, you know, if you look back at the reports, they're like, he has extra lungs, you know. Mm -hmm. um, somehow he's superhuman. He's like the, the sort of positive version of the, you know, freak show. Exactly. You know, and um, at the same time then, it is all about tragedy too. Mm. Um, I start the book with a quote from William Dean Howells, a novelist, where he supposedly told Edith Wharton, um, what Americans want is a tragedy with a happy ending. And I think there's something about that that right. Lance Armstrong tapped into, right? He, he, he ate off both of those things. He, right. he really dined on um, sort of our desire to recover, mm -hmm. you know, to go beyond, to be our best selves, all these things that are very noble. Um, and I think that's what's really nefarious about the hoax. That makes sense, too, with Fry, right? Because he had come through some bad oh, yeah. family circumstances. We wanted this narrative no, he, of he had remaking said he had, himself. Uh, you know, gotten himself off drugs, a famous book, um, A Million Little Pieces, that Oprah picked uh, and then you know, had him on mm. to sort of excoriate him. But um, he, uh, you know, he, he very much was taking this, you know, he was in jail uh, like a couple hours. Um, but he said he went to prison, you know, straight up jail, you know, prison right. time, like hardcore time. And so then I always thought what was strange about it. So he gets busted for the first book. Turns out he wasn't, didn't just cure himself without any help. And he didn't get on a plane with, you know, half his face bleeding onto his shirt. Um, I remember a comedian at the time said, like, I can't get on with an extra carry-on. And this guy, <laughs> this guy claimed, you know, and I remember reading it and looking at it and thinking, this is bunk, you know, mm. and putting it down. Um, so obvious on the face of it, especially now. But, um, you know, it's extreme because that's what it takes to get us to not look at it too closely. Hmm. It's just so over the top. Um, but then I kept thinking, why, you know, there was a sequel to A Million Little Pieces where he's in jail for the whole sequel. And they still sell it, you know. <laughs> right. It's called My Friend Leonard, which is, you know... But wait, isn't, wasn't that actually pitched as a novel? Well, the first book, yeah, was pitched as a novel. Right. And uh, that was the word on the street, you know. Um, it, wasn't t it wasn't bought as a novel, so he sold it as nonfiction. Yeah. 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 Which is a problem, right? Right. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but, you know, I was just fascinated that the, there was this sequel to the fakery. Mm. This kept going, and that almost seemed the point. Just keep it going. Just keep it and going. And so much of that sequel, especially, is about race, mm. you know, is about him in jail dealing with uh, race, and he teaches a black uh, illiterate man to read. It's like Huck on a raft. Right. It's huh. bad, man. We keep coming back to Huck on, on the raft. <laughs> um, so so uh, I think we're... we're, we're uh, you got five minutes. Five minutes, okay, before we... Questions. Before questions. Um, what else do you want to talk about? You want to see a slide? To show more pictures. Let's see. Can you go past where we were? Oh, these are fascinating. Oh, this is yeah. a, a Barnum show from later, um, later in the 1860s. Um, it's called The Sarcassian Beauty. And in it, he claimed that um, this woman, who is the first Sarcassian Beauty, and down here you probably can't see it, it says Sarcassian Girl, or um, the star of the East. Can you go ahead one? I think there's an image. This is um, how she was depicted. And you see now an exhibition at Barnum's Museum. Um, and she was an idea, you know, idea he had of this woman who has what looks like an afro, mm -hmm. was the height of white beauty. Mm. Um, but also white beauty on jeopardy. Sarcassia really was a region where there was unrest, especially around this time. And, you know, it's related to Caucasian as a, mm -hmm. another kind of fiction. Um, and so this idea of the Sarcassian girl, which was really a fascinating one, was like, he, he tapped into all this mix of race. Uh, can we keep going? Keep going a while. I think there's some bum slides. I'm sorry. Keep going. We can't get into these, sadly, but um, that's a fake Franz Klein. I love that one. Um, keep going. These are real folks. These are um, Fijians that he, uh, Barnum did display, um, but they were actual 
um, Fijians, at least he was. So these two are young Circassian beauties that follow in the footsteps of Zaluma Agra. And she, you see she's called Cannibal Fairchild. And that's all I know about her. I can't find more info on her. Um, and I believe this is her as well. Don't, don't you think that's the same person? Um, what a beautiful look she has, right? Mm -hmm. But she's supposed to be a white girl in danger, a Circassian beauty. But I started thinking about, well, what about all the black folks who must have said, well, I'm going to get out of X place mm -hmm. by being a Circassian for, right. for a few months and being the height of white beauty. Um, under threat. Does, does, does that mean that, um, you know, certain kinds of passing are hoaxes too? I really avoided passing as best I could because I think passing is slightly different. Mm. Um, you know, often it's passing from black to white is the typical, but it challenges our sort of notions of racial divisions and racial structures, which are, you know, less fixed than we, we believe they are. Mm. And I think the hoax does the exact opposite. It really reinforces them. It okay. says that, you know, this, I can be, you know, native, but I'm gonna be a sad native with a tear running down my face, like the Indian in that pollution commercial, you right, remember that? From, from 40 years ago or so? Yeah, yeah, 1971, I think. Yeah. Um, and I grew up my whole life thinking, oh, wow, that was a powerful ad. He was canoeing down a river of garbage. Does anyone out there remember that? Mm -hmm. um, that's a f fake Indian guy. Right, right. He, he died and it turned out he was like, I don't know. Not, not. A, a Minnesotan white guy or something. Yeah. Um, but you think about what those powerful images mean, you know, because mm -hmm. it also means that black people or native people aren't, you know, they're just dyed black or brown, you know, they're just dyed white people. Mm. And I think that that kind of is what is at stake at the blackface we were talking about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, what does it mean to have a cultural identity just stripped of all its uh, right. actual meaning? I think, I think the, the, the way you put it in the book is that um, white Americans would look at uh, African Americans or indigenous people and see them as lesser versions of white folks, that they just have a disease that has diminished them. Well, it's not, a, it's not just what, that's the structure of race, unfortunately, right. is that the story of race is trying to figure out how did we get to be different. Um, and over the 19th century, what I came to understand is it doesn't get better, our vision of race, but it gets worse. Mm. And that the racial hierarchies, which were sort of there in the 18th century, get worse and worse and worse by the end of the 19th century. And so, you know, the categories were always kind of there, but then they get more and more strict and subdivided. And, and I really started to feel like any kind of categorization just led to this hierarchy, right? Um, even the categorization of animals and, mm -hmm. and that it kind of led to that. But um, specifically, you know, um, there was a kind of need for an opposition, you know, like someone to be below in order to raise up right. whomever else. And you had to have a foe to fight <laughs> and beat. I guess it's, it's, it's much more elaborate than that, you know, it's much more intricate. Sure. I think that's what's troubling is it's hard to fight it because it's so, we believe that there's this difference even though there is this not biological reason for it. Right. But worse, the hoax is always look going to that place, mm -hmm. you know. Um, always pretending to be things to be, as I say, worser than they are, you know? Worser. And it's usually like that other guy is a cannibal. You know, no one in your own family is a cannibal. It's always like over the next hill, those other people. Right, right. And you know, this little girl, I think of a lot, and her being called a cannibal fair child, which is like such a series of contradictions. Right. Um, what does that mean for us? Hmm. I think that's a perfect place for us to pause and open it up. Uh, I think there are a few microphones around. Uh, please put your hand in the air if you have a question and the mic will come to you. Kevin, hi, I'm a journalist and unavoidably have to ask you how your work informs your take, whatever it might be, on Trump, the currency of the term fake news and yeah. his use of the term. I mean, it's relatively recent um, 
it's gained relatively recent entry into sure. our lexicon. Yeah, um, in the book, I actually have a, um, a cover of a book, and it's from 1917, um, called Fakes in American Journalism. It doesn't quite say fake news, but this idea of 100 years ago was floating around as a kind of shorthand. Um, that said, I think fake news has two things that I think the hoax too has, which is that it's something that's actually happening. There's actual news that's being promulgated that is fake. And at one point in the book, I, sort of exasperatedly, I say, you know, I, I liked fake news better when it was just called propaganda, you know. <laughs> um, but um, so there's that. And as we found out in the past few weeks, you know, it was way worse than we even thought. These mm -hmm. sort of targeted ads, fake activist groups, pe disinformation, you know that's purposefully either like crazy activist stuff to enrage people or the opposite, you know, just a lot and of- And especially racialized. Oh, it's super racialized. Yeah. It goes without saying, I suppose. But then there's the other side of fake news, which is fake news is an accusation against someone else. Um, and it just means news I don't like. Um, and so that's really a troubling thing to try to fight. I mean, I think the hoax does much of the same thing. There's there's the actual hoaxing that goes on, and then there's accusing someone else of a hoax. I'm gonna get them before mm -hmm. they get me. And you know, birtherism, I think, is a great example of that. You know, Obama's, anything he said was just called a hoax. Um, and that's a, a really troubling moment that's also laced with race. So I guess I would go to thinking about how race informs some of these questions, um, and the way that there's this double meaning for fake news or the hoax itself. And I kind of end the book talking about what I call the age of euphemism, which very much is about this kind of double speak that brings us back, I, I'm afraid, to bunk. Your next question's over here. So I'm curious to know how you feel about a link between social media and the rise of post facts and fake news. And then also with you having looked at the history back into the 20th, late earlier, 20th and 19th century, are there analogs to kind of social media, like you mentioned penny newspapers, that kind of thing? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, the internet, I think, is probably most related to the penny press, is the best um, example I could find that links those two moments from the 1830s to now, um, in part because it also promised a kind of democratic, f nearly free, kind of access, right, to information. Um, but it also was quickly filled with advertisements, um, the worst probably thing on earth, advertorials, mm -hmm. you know, um, and, and a kind of, you know, uh, bunk that really pushes an agenda. Um, at the same time, I think, the penny press, there was a sense that you could find lots, you could read different points of view, and you kind of knew what your paper, which is, you, you know, papers used to be five cents, then they became one penny. Um, you kind of knew what your point of view was. So it wasn't really about objectivity. And I think objectivity, which emerges a little later, is a bit more troubling, you know, because it then can sort of seem like, well, I'm just being objective. I'm getting both sides of, you know, is slavery good or bad, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so we start to end up in a world that I think the internet has, you know, very much like Penny Press on one hand, but the other hand, it's kind of a brave new one, or maybe less brave. Um, and you can end up in a l little bit of a bubble, right? Um, just getting the feed you, you want. And I guess for me, people sometimes ask me, how can we get past that? And I think, you know, thinking about different sources, thinking of the breadth that the internet could provide, but it often doesn't. I mean, we often go to the top two, uh, I mean, do we go to the second page of Google results? Um, Professor? I do. Oh, shoot. My students don't. But, yeah. You know. I mean, I think it's hard, right? You know, we, we get the information we get, but I also would say, you know, we built the internet. We can sort of think about the internet critically. We can change the internet and make it not just a free-for-all, but a place that we get the information we want. You know, mm -hmm. what I say in the book is the internet contains most anything, but it doesn't contain everything. And what I was struck by when I was doing the research is how many of the hoaxes just disappeared. You know, if I hadn't gone into the archive, I wouldn't have found those images, you know. But they exist, they're there, and they're there for us to find and, and discover. And 
you know, also, I don't sort of, I think the internet could be neutral. I'm not sure it is right now. <laughs> but, you know, it often is the internet that caught a lot of these internet hoaxes, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, I take it that you want us to draw a line of connection between P.T. Bonham and Trump. And I might suggest one. You're saying how entertaining his uh, Bonham's hoaxes were to folks that he could very well have run for president almost. And is it, is it true that, do you think, that an enormous part of, of Trump's appeal is precisely the hoaxes and, and uh, fakery that really entertains people and enthralls them? It's a great question. Um, Barnum actually did run for an office um, in his state and lost. Um, I think there is a bit of a connection. They're, they're both show people, and quite literally, I mean, Trump was a TV star, mm -hmm. um, certainly. Uh, and I, but you know, I also take Ta-Nehisi Coates's point that some of his rise was uh, birtherism. You know, I'm not sure I 100% agree, but I think that's an interesting take on it. Um, certainly, it's what made him go from being in the sphere of entertainment to politics. Though I think Barnum and probably, as you suggest, Trump understand that those two don't have as bright a line between them right. as as we might have thought. Um, I, I guess I think I work it out a bit in the book, you know, but a lot of this came right at the end. So it's sort of the coda of the book is very much about mm -hmm. this moment. And um, I, I hesitate to say read the book and you'll, you'll know the answer. Um, but I also think that some of the answer is, is thinking about the ways in which um, we ourselves, it isn't just someone out there, but we ourselves participate in that. Um, and that's what I think concerns me is you can lose track. Barnum knew very well, you'd go to his American Museum and you saw that um, flyer, there's a million shows going on at once and the sea lion is just as important as what is it, is just as important as what can they be mm -hmm. as the albino Moore family, you know, the white Moors he used to show. So it's that kind of panoply, the, the wholeness of it that we have to stand back and think about um, and you know, maybe when we do, we see something very similar. I'd add really quickly, there's a, not to take us away from Bunk, but there's mm -hmm. a, 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 it's worth your time to look at this piece that's in Politico, I think it just came out two days ago, where a reporter goes to Trump country to talk about whether or not people are still with him. And um, this is in Western Pennsylvania. And not only are they with him, the, the thing, the point of kind of communion for many of these voters is that um, even though they see the opioid crisis happening around them, even though they kind of understand that uh, Trump is not going to bring coal mining back in the way that he promised, they don't care. They actually don't care whether he comes through on his promises or not. They like that he's going after people they feel aggrieved by, whether that's, uh, you know, Mexicans and Central Americans who are coming across the border seemingly illegally, or, you know, NFL football players who are, you know, protesting, um, you know, inadequate uh, uh, justice arrangements in, in the U.S. Um, and they take a special issue, I think, with these exotic others, so to speak. Um, and I, I couldn't help but think about some of the things that Kevin is teaching us about ourselves in this book uh, while reading that piece. Yeah, I mean, I think thinking about, you know, I think we often, it's like, what can they be? Like, what can we be? You know, how do we understand ourselves through these kind of questions and interactions? And mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't want to think that it's the hoax or our current fake news cycles, which aren't necessarily fake, but are being called that, um, are preying on these same divisions but it seems like they're very similar even to 100 years ago. This will be your last question over here. Isn't uh, faking of military records or else taking a record and then claiming you were in combat when you weren't, isn't it pretty common in American history going back even to the Revolutionary War? And secondly, uh, 
when you were talking about hoaxes, I remember reading Little Big Man, the novel, and yeah. I think that's a great novel about hoaxers, but he's, the protagonist is so charming that you just go from hoax to hoax and you cut right. him all the slack. It's a great question. I only saw the movie quite too young to have really, <laughs> shouldn't have seen it, um, with Dustin Hoffman, you know. Um, so, but I do think there's a, you know, it goes to this question that I ask, is there something American about the hoax? Um, and I, I think, you know, I'd be curious what people say once they get to read it and, and think about it. Is it an American problem? Yes and no. You know, I think that there is this history that lends itself to it, and we kind of cheer them on. And some of that's what you're saying, mm. uh, voters or, 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 or folks like. But there's also, I think, a, a deeper kind of a belief in change and a reinvention that is super American that we, you know, uh, embrace. Um, I took it out of the book in the end, but there, you know, Obama's second inauguration, he talks about for just a whole paragraph about reinvention um, and, you know, how that is American. And so I think there's a kind of desire throughout uh, American history um, to think about it. And I also started thinking about this way back with the stories around Lincoln or Washington mm -hmm. who had lots of hoaxes mm -hmm. around them. They're all about honesty, you know. They're like, I did not chop down the cherry tree, right. which is not a true story. Um, I mean, he, it's not that he chopped down the cherry tree, there was no cherry tree. Um, <laughs> and then Lincoln, you know, honest Abe. And so thinking about what honesty means is really interesting to me. But your, the first part of your question also, there's a, a moment in it where I talk about um, a fake native uh, um, character, a guy named, who went by Nas Dij. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how you say it because it's made up. Um, but he pretended also to be a vet. Um, and that linkage, I think, is there definitely. And I, I talk a little bit about a book that's really, uh, I think, an impressive piece of research called Stolen Valor a big old thick book where someone goes through and all these cases, I mean, case after case, some quite egregious and some elected officials, of course, who had pretended to be a certain thing. And they are smart about what the cultural need is there. You know, to say you were in Vietnam, what does that mean? Um, and again, I think that hoaxing goes a lot to questions of our social divisions and what they tell us about ourselves. Thanks for your question. And thanks, y'all, for coming out. I think that's it. I think it. our time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>